here we go. Hello, everyone. This is Amy Robertson. I am the Science Coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. I want to welcome, welcome you to our webinar today um, on phenology for wildlife conservation and climate adaptation. Our presenter is Carolyn Enquist, who works for the USA National Phenology Network. She's the Science and Applications Coordinator. This topic is one that's of great interest to the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and our various partners. And so we're very pleased that Carolyn agreed to give us a webinar today. So a little bit about Carolyn's background. Um, she has worked on biodiversity issues for two decades, having worked for the National Wildlife Federation, the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, and the Wildlife Society. She has largely focused on the conservation and management implications of climate change, including the launch of the Southwest Climate Change Initiative, a regional collaboration focused on ad adaptation planning and on-the-ground action. Carolyn has contributed to a number of national reports and scientific papers focused on biodiversity impacts, vulnerability assessment, and adaptation. Most recently, she was a lead author on several writing teams that contributed to the 2014 National Climate Assessment. Carolyn currently coordinates the U.S. National Phenology Network Science and Applications Activities based out of the University of Arizona. So thank you very much, Carolyn, and I will hand things over to you. Great. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate um, the Desert Landscape Cooperative, Conservation Cooperative invitation to talk to you today about how phenology information can help inform conservation management, and particularly um, in the context of climate adaptation. So here's a quick overview of what I'll cover, starting with a definition of phenology to get us all on the same page. And then I'll discuss its relationship to climate. So we'll start with uh, phenology and followed by some applications. And then I'll give you an overview of the USA National Phenology Network. So first, though, just to be clear, this is what phenology is not. It is not phrenology, a science focused on measurements of the human skull and size of the brain, and nor is it phonology, a branch of linguistics concerned with the organization of sounds and language. So now more seriously, um, many of you may actually be familiar with this uh, definition. The phenology is the study of recurring plant and animal life cycle stages. So this can include leafing and flowering, maturation of agricultural plants, um, emergence of insects, and migration of birds. Um, and also kind of more broadly, this includes uh, their seasonal changes, especially the timing and relationship with weather and climate. So phenology has a strong relationship to climate, as I've sort of uh, mentioned. And this is particularly clear because of these attributes. It's highly sensitive to climate, scales from lake to globe, and it's linked to most aspects of ecosystem processes. So because of this relationship, the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, stated that phenology is perhaps the simplest process in which to track changes in the ecology of species in response to climate change. And the EPA, in some of its recent reports, also recognized this role and has declared it a key indicator of climate impact. So as an indicator of climate impacts, phenology is key to understanding the response of organisms. This is highlighted in many seminal studies, such as this one by Camille Parmesan. Um, as you can see here on the um, y-axis, we have um, earlier, meaning in days. So negative 20 is uh, 20 days earlier than normal. Zero would be normal. 10 would be 10 days later. Um, and we are looking across a number of taxa, a total of 230, uh, 203 species, and data sets within each of those um, species that range from 17 to 99 years in duration. 
And so Parmesan studied this and found that, well, on average, we've seen advancements in spring phenology or trend toward earlier phenology in spring events. Um, this really varies across taxa. So the key point here is, yes, while things are getting earlier overall, um, by an average of 2.8 days per decade, really there we see a lot of variation across species and taxa. So moreover, the rate or the velocity of climate change is variable across land and ocean surfaces, as shown in the study by Burroughs. And this is true especially in the northern hemisphere. So here we have the percent of land or ocean and then this, again, is sort of on the uh, x-axis is sort of what we were seeing on the, the y-axis previously, and that's um, seasonal shift in days per decade. And you can see that spring is advancing on most land surfaces in the northern hemisphere, as indicated by this dark red, yet there's still a lot of regional variability. So the question becomes, can spe species keep pace? with this variability and change. So what we're starting to see is that some species can and some species can't. And this variability in the velocity of change can have profound implications for species interactions. This is something that uh, more folks are starting, more researchers are starting to look at and it's called um, phenological or trophic mismatch. So in the study that I'm going to highlight here, what we found is um, that Bath et al. Um, in Europe found that English oak, okay, this is the English oak, and this is sort of this wonky curve right here, sort of its typical uh, phenology. Now it's cued by temperature, and it's starting to leaf earlier. And then the uh, larvae for the winter moth is also cued by temperature and is merging earlier to feed. However, the flycatcher is cued by other variables, this is the pied flycatcher, such as photo period, is not changing arrival time and is missing peak larval, um, peak larval abundance. So we have fitness ramifications for phenological mismatch. And in this case, we've seen declines in the pike podcatcher because it's become more out of sync with its peak eating or its peak um, food resource. So this is why we as resource managers and conservation practitioners should be concerned about technology. So moving on to the next topic in my presentation. I'll talk more about um, applications for conservation, climate adaptation, and public engagement. So many of you, many of you rather, um, may now be familiar with this graphic representing the climate smart conservation cycle. Um, this cycle or this uh, new guidance just came out really within the last uh, month or so, and it draws upon some previous work that other researchers have been doing and sort of compiled it into a really um, comprehensive guidance um, that you can take home in a book format or you can, if you're so lucky, you could even take uh, MCTC or the National Climate Training Center's uh, new conservation smart uh, training. Um, so what I'll do, though, in my next few slides is I'll demonstrate how phenology relates to components of this cycle. And in particular, that will be uh, step two, um, where we would assess climate impacts and vulnerabilities, as well as step four, where we track action effect effectiveness and ecological response. In other words, monitoring. Now, I'm sure most of you know, within the past several years, the major land management agencies have, have adopted climate change response plans, such as these from the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Forest Service. 
And of course, one of the key strategies identified is conducting vulnerability assessment. Um, and this is primarily to inform prioritization of conservation and management actions. And so some of you may have seen this little equation that vulnerability is actually a function of several components. Um, where E is exposure, which includes your conservation target exposure to climate or hydrological impact. Um, you take your conservation um, target uh, sensitivity into consideration as well in, in terms of understanding its vulnerability. And then that's moderated by your target's adaptive capacity. So it's the ability to adapt. This could be in the form of phenotypic plasticity or dispersal. So phenological information can inform regional to landscape level vulnerability, especially um, related to sensitivity, as I've highlighted here, and adaptive capacity. So several vulnerability, vulnerability assessment tools also include phenology or already include phenology as a component of their scoring system, um, namely the Nature Serves the Climate Change Vulnerability Index as well as the Forest Services Save approach. Now, at, as an example at the species level, phenological information can be used to make predictions about invasive depth. Some research suggests that if species have the ability to change their phenologies or some sort of um, plasticity, they may be able to increase in population abundance. And we've found that this, in fact, is the case with the invasive fireweed. However, as we saw earlier in the mismatch example, other species, such as some endemic or native species, this actually may not be the case. Carolyn, um, and Amy. Um, I just want to let you know that the lag time on the slides is is really slow right now. Um, oh. So take your okay. time. <laughs> I'm not sure it might be your connection, um, your internet okay. connection. I'm not sure, but so the vulnerability assessment slide just showed up clearly just now. Oh, okay, with the graphic. Yep. Okay. Predicting species. Sorry about that, everybody. Response. That's okay. It's it happens. Okay, so I'll just, try to. Take, I'll take try a to pause save. when you change slides. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll try to avoid the mismatch. Okay, um, so uh, several uh, studies have sort of documented these sort of relationships that I've indicated here on the um, lower right hand side. Okay. So we can also use phenological information to document and predict ecological consequences of change. At continental levels, we might use models to predict the onset of spring, such as the spring indices that are shown here. These are meteorological models that are validated by leafing and blooming of phylax. Then more locally and regionally, we can build on the fact that peak stream flow from snowmelt is correlated with the onset of spring and forecast stream flow. These models can also inform phenological models related to bark beetle outbreaks and wildfire in the West. Yet, while managers and conservation practitioners get the importance of adaptive management, and I should actually step back here. Um, before, or excuse me, the Fish and Wildlife Service has recently, um, in some of their, their response plan language, has pointed out that climate change makes monitoring and adaptive management more important than ever. Um, only after we have established robust monitoring schemes will be, be able to effectively modify our strategies over time. So as I was starting to say, um, yet while managers and conservation practitioners get the importance of adaptive management, monitoring itself is often given just lip service and is typically not implemented. This may be largely due to limited budgets, staff time, but also that some do not see the inherent value in it and don't want to invest in it.
So why would we want to do monitoring? Why would we want to invest in monitoring at this point, particularly with climate change? Well, first, it helps provide context for understanding climate-related impacts and vulnerabilities in the context of adaptive management. In other words, it really helps reduce uncertainty about climate impacts and vulnerabilities. And then also, it helps guide adjustments in our current strategies and actions. So it can help us evaluate eff efficacy. So how do we do it? We need to think carefully about this and select, um, select monitoring um, variables that will help us answer questions related to our hypotheses of ecological change related to climate. This starts with ensuring that we monitor climate relevant variables. In other words, we identify biodiversity indicators of climate change impacts, such as these. Um, essential bio biodiversity variables, or EDVs, which have been modeled off of essential climate variables that are currently used by the United Nations Convention Framework on Climate Change. Um, and so you can see there's a suite of things. There's different classes and EBV examples here. And because my talk focuses on phenology, I'll point out that this is an EBV and arguably phenological information can be used to inform the other variables as well. In other words, it can be viewed as a cross-cutting variable. So along these lines, phenology also cross-cuts spatial, temporal, and biological scales. Here are some metrics that can be derived from seasonal and phenological information. Some of these, in fact, will be included in the National Climate Assessment's new indicator system, which will be coming out later this year. So if you are interested in phenological information at the continental to global level, you might choose to use these metrics, such as growing degree days, timing and duration of freeze events, timing and frequency of extreme events, um, synchronicity, and natural variation. At the landscape to regional level, uh, you might consider the timing of snow melt and peak stream flow. The start of season and the dura uh, duration of season. This can be derived um, from remote sensing using NDVI metrics, for example. And also the start of fire season and duration of fire season. At the species to landscape level, you might be interested in the timing of leaf and bloom or the timing of animal emergence and migrations. So in turn, by monitoring this information, we can inform decisions, um, management decisions, and evaluate and optimize management actions, particularly as management windows change related to when to burn, when to mow, when to graze, when to flood, et cetera. So here's a local Tucson example um, about using phenological information to time the application of herbicide. So as most of you know, or probably many of you know, buffalo grass is an aggressive non-native species that's spreading rapidly and introducing fire to the sensitive Sonoran Desert. Fires fueled by buffalo grass can be devastating to sensitive desert plants as well as adjacent homes and structures. So herbicide is the preferred treatment option due to rugged and inaccessible terrain. Um, treatments should be scheduled to maximize buffalo grass greenness while minimizing damage to native species. So um, locally, actually, our executive director, Jake Welfine, um, has collected information on buffalo grass along Pima Canyon for a number of years. And so this is an example of how you might then plot those data. So greenness levels are here, and that's actually derived from um, remote sensing data, so an NDVI. 
And then his ground-based data um, are these little dots. So um, the red is our flowers, the yellow seeds, and then the blue are the sample dates. And by plotting this information this way, you can sort of get an idea as to when um, it might be appropriate to apply herbicide to minimize other impacts to other species as well as capture peak greenness and perhaps knock out some of the flowers before they succeed. Now, most natural resource managers recognize the benefit and are man mandated to do so to invest in public engagement. But phenology monitoring as a citizen science effort is rap rapidly gaining attention relative to the benefits that I've laid out here. So phenology monitoring um, via sort of citizen science um, can help enhance existing agency management pro or engagement programs, helps connect people to nature and the outdoors, provides hands-on formal and informal education opportunities, improves climate and science literacy through experiential learning. And one of the most important attributes is that it really can help us as managers and practitioners and scientists help move the public beyond the gloom and doom of climate change and enable them to see it with their own eyes and start thinking about what needs to be done and ultimately creating the political will um, for policy action. Okay, so moving on to the last section of my talk, I will give you sort of an overview of the National Phenology Network. Now here's our vision statement. Um, we view the network as a national network of, of observers, both professional and citizen scientists, that contribute to developing an understanding of how plants, animals, and landscapes respond to environmental variation and climate change. We have a broad spatial distribution of observers, again, comprised of both professional and citizen scientists. Um, we have over 11 sites represented across the nation. You can see there's a few holes in certain places that we're hoping to um, fill in in time. But as of this month, we have over 3.6 million records, phenological records, in our National Phenology Database. Now, Nature's Notebook is how is our program and how we implement phenology monitoring um, for really all of our stakeholder groups. Um, this provides direct access to our uh, national phenology database. And so Nature's Notebook in and of itself can sort of be viewed as this comprehensive phenology monitoring program. And you start with this web interface to the database. And the attributes of Nature's Notebook include over 100, or excuse me, over 900 species, a third animals and two thirds plants are represented. We have core protocols and species protocols or profiles for each of these. Um, we've also developed a suite of comprehensive education materials and resources that are free to download. Um, we also have a number of tools, including a data download tool, which you can um, download uh, raw data for a species or a region that's indicated, or even just a single phenophase. But also we're developing more quality controlled and data um, um, value added data products, such as some data summaries, where we'll do some of the work for you so that you don't have to wade through um, the complexity of the raw data. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, our data products in just a moment. Um, we also have a dynamic data visualization tool that can be used to uh, view data um, spatially and temporally. And in addition, to make it easier to collect data, we have mobile applications for both Android and iPhone uh, platforms. 
So as I mentioned, an emerging goal of ours is to develop and deliver our data in the most useful way to our stakeholders, primarily in the form of raw data and value-added products. So as the basis of these products, we are deriving key phen phenological metrics, otherwise known as phenometrics. And I'll represent these in a graphical format where you see um, in this graph the time is on the bottom um, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the phenophase measure. And this um, can be a probability, a proportion of sites, number of individuals, etc. So this this um, represents three different species, so X, Y, and Z, and you can see that the timing of a particular phenophase for a given species can be really different. But what you can derive from this is first, onset, we, um, um, that is one of our key uh, phenometrics, again a basic phenometric is deriving um, a value for the onset by different species, by different species groups, um, or even across regional areas. So again, it scales because in how you uh, calculate onset or for a particular phenophase. Um, the other phenometric is the duration. How long does a particular phenophase last? And ultimately, what was the magnitude of that phenophase? So these three basic phenometrics can serve as sort of the basis of a number of data products that we're currently developing. So an example is a recent one that we've done um, is to look at the onset of leafing um, uh, of eastern deciduous trees um, across a number of years and look at that um, with maximum temperature. And we found that between 2009 and 2013, with increasing temperatures, the onset of spring leaf out is becoming earlier for these deciduous tree species across the eastern U.S. So these, this kind of information at the regional level and even the continental level can help sort of frame the science, you know, to getting sort of a pulse of the planet, if you will. But many of you may be interested in well, how do you bring that down to the ground? How might managers use that information to inform their decision making? And so we've entered into a, uh, a partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service's um, National Refuge Systems Inventory and Monitoring Initiative. And uh, this partnership has been going on for about three years. And this past year, we implemented a pilot to sort of develop some guidance for how you might implement phenology monitoring um, um, more locally and then scale that regionally. So our pilot started um, at a brand new wildlife refuge, um, the Valle de Oro. Many of you may be familiar with that if you're in the southwest. Um, it's just south of Albuquerque, and that's kind of this uh, little um, crazy map over here. Actually, it's kind of maybe kind of hard to see because there's so many colors. But the colors are representing the other public lands um, along the Rio Grande corridor. So it's really the the refuge is sort of part of a broader regional network of protected areas along the Rio Grande. So it was established in 2012. Like I said, south of Albuquerque, New Mexico the first urban wildlife refuge in the Southwest. And a key activity is community engagement. Um, you're showing the local community why it's important to do management and how they can become involved and appreciate what's going on. Um, they want to do a lot of restoration. And the drawback, though, is that the funding only allowed one staff member, and that's the refuge manager. So she's determined to still meet these ambitious goals, these management objectives that include documenting the change in species richness and abundance of animals in response to restoration, um, understanding shifts in the phenology of animals and plants, and managing invasive species. As I mentioned, she not only has management goals, but she has specific outreach goals. And this is, includes providing a unique long-term environmental education and recreation opportunity for the urban community, 
and help fulfill the goals of America's Great Outdoors initiative, which is a White House initiative that sort of filters down through all the departments and ultimately reconnects people of all ages to the natural world. So, um, what we did um, starting in um, last fall, in about September, October, we worked with refuge manager to identify a suite of focal species um, prepare a sampling design, and because there's only one refuge staff member, to train up um, a suite of volunteers. And these volunteers come in the form of master naturalists, master gardeners, uh, a friends group, as well as local schools. So there's been a number of groups that have been particularly interested and um, are really active and engaged in the whole process. So now I'm going to show you some uh, preliminary results of this work. So this is in the form, this graph is in the form of what we're calling a phenology calendar. So here, observers track the onset and duration of three phenophases for two species, tree, two tree species, and that's the invasive Siberian elm and the native cottonwood. And so you can see there's three phenophases, including breaking leaf buds, fruit, and leaves. So typically, invasive Siberian elms leaf out and fruit earlier than native Rio Grande uh, cottonwoods. As such, you can see that Siberian elm got a head start on cottonwoods by putting out leaves first. So we're hoping by next year, um, observers will be able to track better the onset of breaking leaf buds and fruits, which has already started, which had already started this year when the observers began their work. But ultimately, baseline data like these will, <clears throat> excuse me, help the refuge time their restoration activities to avoid peak seed dispersal in Siberia in that realm. So here's another calendar focused on um, the video's vocal bird species. We've already seen some changes in species composition since monitoring started last year, with some of the larger birds arriving and leaving the refuge, such as the sandhill cranes, and spring migrants starting to arrive. Um, so while this is still early on, you can kind of see sort of the emerging um, importance of information like this, you know, especially in terms of baseline data that will help uh, the refuge see how species composition and number of animals change. Um, with restoration activities. So finally, a main goal of this pilot, and then ultimately working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, is to identify guidelines and a framework for implementing phenology monitoring via our Nature's Notebook program. This includes how to implement a phenology trail um, to help refuges leverage capacity and resources from other organizations in the region. And one of the first phenology trails is actually um, in Tucson. Um, now, all of our resources that we generated from this project um, are posted on our website. And we have a special website just for the um, Fish and Wildlife Service, as you can see over here, um, where they can derive information on the pilot, but also um, information and tools that are specific to refuge, the refuges. So ultimately, um, our standardized protocols will simplify comparisons not only across refuges, but across the country to help refuges meet their management goals, particularly to address climate change. And our long-term program also helps integrate outreach with management and fosters collaboration among many different organizations. So I'll wrap it up on a philosophical note, featuring the words of Elder Leopold, written over 60 years ago. And he actually recognized that phenology, in short, is a horizontal science, which transects all ordinary biological professions, 
whoever sees the land as a whole is likely to have an interest in it. Thank you, Carolyn. So, so I just will say one last thing and just invite you to explore joining our growing list of partners by visiting our website. And thank you for your attention. I'll take questions. All right. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Um, you did a great job of really pointing out the importance of phenology and how it cuts across um, so many things that the conservation community is concerned with um, and can help us understand the impacts of climate change and, and possibly adaptation as well. Um, so I want to open it up for questions to the audience. Um, if you all look at the top of your WebEx, there's a little, if you hover at the top of your screen, there's a little um, bar that comes down. And if you click on participants, you'll get a box um, that shows all the folks on, on the webinar. And at the bottom, there's a little raise hand button. So let's try using that first. If you have a question, go ahead and, and click that button and, and we'll call on you. Um, and if anyone's having issues with that, we'll just open it up as well. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions. I see a question from Sue Watkins. Okay, so Sue, you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, this is Sue Watkins. I'm with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University. Um, I was wondering if any tribes have gotten involved in the National Phenology Network? Um, you know, that has been um, one of those uh, stakeholder groups that we really um, need to focus on more. Um, it's, you know, quite honestly, I. Um, um, we haven't done the kind of job that we need. Um, we have attended the Rising Voices um, Conference um, in Colorado but that last year and have sent um, an, um, someone this year as well to help kind of um, engage that group via that venue. Um, the Great Plains Climate Science Centers um, director also has a program with some tribes um, or has a program with some tribes um, and one is that of I believe it was Haskell College in Kansas mm -hmm. and so um, a representative from our office traveled there and helped a group there set up a phenology trail along the campus um, but really beyond some of those kind of preliminary efforts we have yet to really engage more with tribes and would really like to do so and would love to have your help, Sue, in doing yeah. that. Okay, yeah. Um, so you you also do animal species, not plant species, right? That's correct. Because there is a yeah. um, Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, which has a national conference, and they also have regional conferences. And that might be, you know, one venue to, you know, reach out to tribes. Uh-huh. That's great. And also, I send out a monthly tribal climate change newsletter, and um, I'm happy to send out information about upcoming events or say if you have some kind of report that comes out. And I will put a blurb in the next one just about the Phenology Network, you know, with a link to the website. Great. That would be fantastic. And if you need us to provide you with any sort of information, specific information, don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, great. Or give text you. or whatever. Thank you, Sue. And also, this webinar will be posted um, on the Desert LCC YouTube channel. So if you're um, sending out information about the National Phenology Network, you might want to um, include that link, too. Okay. Um, do I find that link at your website? Um, it's If you search for Desert LCC and YouTube, it will be up okay. there within a week or so. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. And I think there is a link to it from our website as well. All right. Um, do you see any? I can't see the hands that are raised, Carolyn, since you're the presenter. Do you see any other hands there? Yeah, I see uh, Kathleen Blair. So you'll have to press star six to unmute yourself. Star six. There we go. 
Hello? Yes, hello. Hello. Yes, yes. Um, I'm out here on the lower Colorado River, on the Bill Williams River, and uh, one thing that, that we have a, a complicating factor with, with phenology, is rainfall. Because so many of our desert species Perfect. out here are responding to rainfall uh, as a at least a covariant, if not a dominant, on things. And sometimes it's not even immediate rainfall. That may be just something with with the annuals. But some of our cactus, it apparently it's working out that it may have been how much it rained, you know, three years ago. That's actually triggering uh, the the degree of their response for for flowering and fruiting. Uh, so uh, I haven't noticed on on the phenology um, databases and things like that how these desert systems that have got such a powerful uh, rain base uh, how that's being monitored in order to account for that as opposed to just temperatures and daily. Yeah, um, that's a really great question, and <clears throat> given that this is the desert landscape conservation, um, uh, LCC rather, I, you know, I think that your your question is really, really um, important, and unfortunately there's less information um, known about desert plants um, phenologically because it is really, it's hard to... Um, capture clear patterns um, because of the extreme variability, particularly as related to um, rainfall. That said, we are monitoring a number of desert plants um, uh, throughout the Sonoran Desert, but also um, kind of similarly um, throughout the Mediterranean. Um, we had a California um, um, phenology project through the Park Service that ran for about three years, and in some places it's still active, and a lot of species there, it's the same thing. It's, a, it's the rainfall is the trigger um, because it's a less temperate um, climate, and so uh, one of our um, research associates has really been focusing closely on, on that, and um, trying to flesh out sort of what these different triggers are for different species, um, the lag times, et cetera. So I'd say it's definitely a work in progress, and any information that you bring to that is, would be fantastic. Yes, um, I, 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 I sort of started doing a bit of this several years ago, but, I mean, I could be three weeks difference, and it depended entirely on whether or not it rained on the 20th of October, not what <laughs> temperature it was. And exactly. our rains out here are so patchy. I mean, I've got saguaros blooming on one side of the road, but not the other. Yes. Um, so, so you you not only need and and getting, you know, weather data from the nearest airport 45 miles away is pretty trivial. Uh, you know, because what rainfall there is is so patchy for at least half of the the rainfall in the Sonoran Desert, which is monsoonal. Uh, yeah. So you you just about have to have a weather station where your patch is to get a handle on that. Have you um, heard of the Citizen Science Program Cocoa Rods? No. And it's this crazy complicated name. It's like the uh, Colorado um, Coalition. It's it's nationwide, but started in Colorado, and they do rainfall monitoring as well as um, hail. And um, they have hundreds of thousands of observations going on, and we've worked with them to try to do um, sort of a joint program where you co-locate um, these sort of simple uh, rain gauges. And then um, also I think they're going to be doing some soil moisture so that or, or um, ET, so evapotranspiration, uh -huh. so that you get kind of the influence because that's the other part of the story here. You know, I mean, we do um, have rain log operational, in it, certainly in the Arizona and the Southwest. Yeah, rain log is is, is quite uh, is, can be quite site specific. Uh, so what's but, particularly powerful, I think, is when you co-locate um, this sort of information true. gathering. Precisely. Yeah, I mean, even with my weather station being 
three miles away from the saguaros I was looking at, that could make all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Depending on how patchy the summer rainfall is. And we certainly invite that kind of information um, in our program and we'll, you know, continue to work hard to ensure that desert systems are duly um, represented. So thanks for raising that question. All right. Um, looks like Jerry, Jerry text us. Correct. Yeah, Jerry right. earlier. Um, good morning. Um, good morning. I, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering how long you have to take phenologic data before you can establish a trend and determine that indeed uh, climate change either has occurred or is occurring as opposed to just annual fluctuations in weather and the distinction between weather and climate. Yeah, excellent question. Um, obviously, the longer you take your data, the better. And you know, at this point, um, five to ten years is really a great baseline um, so that you can then um, you can calculate your trends as well as your anomalies. Um, and, you know, we have shifting baselines, too, so, you know, it depends on the period of time that you're looking at to, um, to to really kind of understand or what sort of changes that you're you're, you're seeing. Um, that said, we feel like even a year's worth of data provides you with some insight. Um, you know, and that's what I was just showing at the uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, sure, you know, if they had 10, 20 more years of data, Wow, you know, they could do it, but that's just not possible right now. And guess what? They've got to start doing restoration activities within the next year or two. So any sort of information is valuable, but, you know, also taking into context other um, information, experience, et cetera, will be important. You wouldn't want to solely make a, a, an assessment just based on one year's worth of data but it can start sort of validating some trends that you know about um, anecdotally even. So I guess the point here is that, um, yes, while longer the better, you can still start deriving some basic information from, um, it's just getting started um, with the process, um, particularly if it's co-located, let's say, weather, um, any sort of weather um, information as well as in any information on performance, um, you know, fitness, biomass, that sort of thing, or abundance data. Um, those three things together can be really powerful. And um, I've seen papers published on that, you know, with only like three years. So, um, yeah, you have to be patient, but then at the same time, I think there is some, you know, basic information that can start coming out of this, much less the engagement with the public. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Great. Thank you, Jerry Hillier. Did Jerry Tagstad also have a question? I did. Yeah, there's two Jerry's and I. Oh, yeah. ah, okay. <laughs> uh, th- thank you. Uh, so this is Jerry Tagstad from uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and we've uh, just finished a project in the Mojave uh, for the DOD looking at fire hazard assessment, but uh, phenology and, and the the, the uh, issues that Kathleen Blair brought up um, as far as the response of vegetation anyway in terms of, of timing, and we only looked at vegetation kind of from a remote sensing standpoint. I'm wondering uh, in the Nature's Notebook dynamic data visualization uh, if there's any uh, effort to go towards that uh, landscape uh, greenness phenology uh, linkage. So you can, since we have remote sensing uh, systems that are coming over daily and weekly, uh, using that data to help inform from a landscape scale uh, what this pulse looks like. Yeah, that's so great that you brought that up because that um, has been identified as one of the next steps that we want to include in the visualization tool. Um, We just recently sort of started a scoping process for how can we improve this. I mean, everything 
that has been online um, for the last year or two is, um, you know, prime for kind of taking the next step. Now that we have a lot more data and have engaged a lot more uh, resource uh, managers as well as researchers, um, we're gaining a lot of insight from these partnerships and um, that remote, remotely sensed linkage um, is, is really crucial. But we also want to point out that, um, you know, the, the NDVI you know, doesn't give you species-specific information. You know, it's just kind of a, a really broad signal. Um, so for a manager, it depends on kind of what your management goal is. So that may or may not help you. But we're hoping that we can combine both ground-based observations with remotely sensed-based observations um, through um, pheno cameras even. Uh, we've been working with Andrew Richardson on pheno cameras and much less the um, satellite-based information as well. And to try to integrate um, the three of those and hopefully um, validate particularly some of that remote sensing information with ground-based ground data. So it's great that you brought that up. So great to know that you're working on that. And um, to the extent that you might be available to help advise us um, on kind of the next uh, stage of our um, um, data visualization tool and, um, you know, bringing in the kind of the realm of remote testing a little bit more explicitly, um, we, we'd love to um, include you in that conversation. Great. I appreciate that. Uh -huh. We've actually launched for the Mojave uh, a tool where you can uh, interactively select a uh, location and see all 15 years of the MODIS uh, weekly signature compared uh -huh. against the term average and things like that. So, um, Carolyn, I'll, I'll follow up with you on how we might uh, talk and go forward. And, um, and also, Amy, perhaps, uh, might be interested in when we are, uh, hold our webinar on that. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Yes, Jerry, this is Amy. We're, we're very interested in that work, and um, if you have a website or something you can share um, about that tool, um, drop me an email. That would be great. I will do so. It's going to be linked through the California Fire Science, uh, but we've talked internally at least about uh, trying to link with you guys, so I'll, I will definitely follow up. Thank you. All right, great. Well, I think we have time for another question or two. Um, Carolyn, do you have any other hands raised there? I see um, Carol Beardmore. Carol, press star six to unmute yourself. Carol, try again. We can't hear you. Star six. Okay, I think that got it. Yes. Can you hear me? Got you now. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Carolyn, I, I'm really c convinced. <laughs> You've really convinced me about the value of this. <clears throat> and I was wondering if um, the Phenology Network has been working with uh, with the Cornell Lab on uh, with the eBird data that's coming in, especially. Uh -huh. on, yeah. And could you talk about that a bit? Yeah. No, that's really another great um, resource. And we've started to do some preliminary analyses looking at some of the eBird abundance data with um, some habitat data, so plants, mm -hmm. from our end, theological information, and are really excited about um, some of the potential for um, integrating um, information on birds and um, the sort of the phenological landscape um, of their ha ha habitats. Um, and so uh, eBird is certainly one of those key um, information sources that um, we have a really great relationship with the Cornell Lab, and we'd like to demonstrate some additional analyses. We have one on our website right now in um, what we call a little vignette. Um, and then we're also working with some of the, the bird observatories, um, so the Rocky Mountain of the Bird Observatory as well as the um, – PRBO, which I guess is now um, Point Blue. Point Blue. Um, they've adopted some of our um, plant phenology monitoring protocols, again, to get sort of that perspective related to birds and their management. 
um, you know, they're pretty robust, and obviously, in um, their protocols related to the birds themselves. But um, we um, have found that, you know, when combined with the protocols that we have for phenological monitoring of their habitat, again, it's really a nice, comprehensive, potentially powerful uh, information source. Yeah, and, uh, you know, also, I mean, anybody could go on to eBird and, and explore data and see when, when the arrival and departure dates are on the, a bar graph. Uh, of the uh, of individual species in 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 any location you you wish. Um, also, I was wondering is is that a vegetation protocol on your website? Because we're yes. So we have um, protocols for um, it's over 600 species of plants, um, and then you can adopt them to sort of you know quote unquote um, sister species. Um, if your particular species doesn't occur, you could go up to the, the genus level um, okay. oftentimes. I, I was particularly <clears throat> interested in the ones that you were working with RMBO and PRBO on. Was that a um, I, I don't case? know um, off the top of my head which species that they're monitoring. Oh, okay. Um, so by species thing? Yeah, and then you do sort of like a collection of species. And I mean, you just have to decide on your um, sampling design, obviously, um, what your plot size is. And but it's more of, um, you know, you could use like three species as an indicator of, um, you know, a, a functional type. So like deciduous. So there's a number of ways to apply the protocols, but the protocols come species by species. Well, maybe I'll, I'll contact you and because we're getting ready to start a grassland bird monitoring project. And, uh -huh. and if we could great. incorporate that fairly easily, that would be great. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Please, please do contact us. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carol. Um, we are out of time. Um, so if you have questions for Carolyn, is there Carolyn, is there a way for folks to contact you if they're interested in, in furthering the discussion here? Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry I didn't put my <laughs> web uh, or my um, email address up here. It's, but it's really easy. Uh, it's just Carolyn, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N, at USANPN. Dot org. So it's basically like the website, but just um, with my first name. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, so that, was, that was really informative, and obviously a lot of people are interested in this topic. I want to thank everyone who took time to join us today. And um, as I said, this will be posted on our Desert LCC YouTube channel. You can find a link to that from our website or just Google Desert LCC YouTube and it'll pop right up. Um, we have a whole series of webinars there. Um, we're adding new ones all the time, so be sure to check that out. And um, thank you. We will hopefully be talking to you again soon. Have a great day. Thank you, Amy.